Hey everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this video, we're going to finish up our discussion of exponential functions, including the natural exponential function, compound interest, and population growth problems. So we're going to start with where does the natural exponential function come from? It is coming from what's called the natural base E. So the E is a number. It is a number where this expression approaches as n is getting larger and larger. So n appears in the denominator as well as the exponent. So if you let the denominator and the exponent simultaneously grow towards infinity, get larger and larger, this expression will get closer and closer to what's being called the number e. We're going to determine what this value is, this value e, by using a table of values. So the graphing calculator, we're going to enter in the function, or the expression, y equals 1 plus 1 divided by x raised to the x power. Once the function has been entered, go to second TBL set, which is window. Make sure that you change the independent variable to be ask, so that way we can enter in any value of the independent variable and keep dependent variable auto, so it will automatically calculate the y values or the dependent variable. Second table, and you'll have a blank table. I already have mine entered in. If you have x equals 1 or n equals 1, 1 plus 1 divided by 1 to the first power, that will give you 2. If you substitute in 2, 1 plus 1 half squared is 2.25. In the calculator, you'll enter in 1, you'll, and you'll get the value 2, enter, you'll get the value, and so on. If n is 5, the value still increases to 2.48832. The calculator only rounds to the nearest four decimal places. At x equals 10 or n equals 10, the values still increase, but not as much. Now it's 2.5937. 100, 2.7048. 1,000, 2.7169. So it definitely looks like the values are approaching a value because the values are getting, they're increasing, but not as quickly. So if you jump to n equals a million, that's very large, you'll have the values 2.71828. The calculator rounds that to 2.7183. The values will continue to get closer and closer to this number e. e is approximately 2.7182818. Four, five, and then so on. This is an irrational number. What that means is that E cannot be written as a fraction or ratio of two whole numbers. Okay, so very similar as pi. Pi is also irrational. Pi has a decimal approximation, but it does not have a repeating decimal approximation just like E, does not have a repeating decimal. So how does this connect with the graphs that we talked about in the previous video? Well, this number E can be the base of an exponential function. So this is the number E. It is greater than zero, it's positive, and it's not equal to one, so the base can be this number, 2.7182818284528, and so on. As long as the variable is the exponent, and the base is greater than zero, but not one, it's an exponential function. This is called the natural exponential function. So how does the graph, what's the graph of the natural exponential function look like? Well, we've talked about this in the previous video. The y equals two to the x is called the doubling function. where the base is 2. And we talk about base 3, it's called the tripling function.
the natural exponential function will be growing from left to right. It will be increasing because the base is greater than 1. And it will be increasing faster than the doubling function, but not as fast as the tripling function because the base is 2.718. Not quite as growing as fast as 3, but definitely growing faster than base 2. So here's the, twin, the first 20 decimals approximation of E. 2.718, You only need to remember that E is about 2.71828. As long as you know the first five decimals of E, that's good. And E is actually in any scientific or graphing calculator. If you go to second and then the division button, you'll see E. So the calculator will give you the first, what, eight or nine decimals? Looks like eight decimals. So it gives you the first eight decimal, approxim decimal approximation of E. So E is stored into the calculator as a function. We're going to find out how do you use exponential functions within applications. So a couple common applications of exponential functions involve uh, population growth, bacterial growth, so continuous growth functions, or radioactive decay, so exponential decay functions. And one very common application of exponential functions involve compound interest problems or continuous compound interest problems. We're going to start with population growth. So the gray wolf population. The gray wolf acquired the reputation as an insatiable killer in the United States in the 19th and 20th centuries. Although the label was undeserved, there were an estimated 2 million wolves shot, trapped, or poisoned in the 19th and 20th centuries. So by the time 1960, there were only about 800 gray wolves remaining in the United States. So as a result, the United States government declared the gray wolf an endangered species and started to introduce the gray wolf into two protected areas of the United States. So the gray wolf was reintroduced into the northern Rocky Mountains, so Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming, and also into the western Great Lakes, which includes the UP. We're going to focus on the population of the gray wolf in the Western Great Lakes in this problem. So they modeled the, the population of the gray wolf using an exponential function. If you notice, if you take the tops of the bars and you connect them with a approximation curve, it looks like, it looks like the population of the gray wolf could be approximated by an exponential function. So that's what they did. The exponential function, 1,145 times, there's this base E, the number E, raised to the 0 0.0325, and then there's the variable X, which is in the exponent. This models the population of the gray wolf in the Western Great Lakes in years after 1978. So part one, according to the model, what was the gray wolf population rounded to the nearest wolf in 2006. So we cannot substitute 2006 into the function for x because x is years after 1978. So we need to determine which year is 2006 in terms of years after 1978. So take 2006, subtract 1978. 2006 is 28 years after 2006, or after 1978. So now we have the value of x that we can substitute in. x is equal to 28, so 1,145 e to the 0.0325 times 28 in the exponent. So let's use our calculator to determine what is the population of the gray wolves. 1,145 
And we talked about how to get E, second division button, exponent. Make sure the exponent goes in parentheses, 0 0.0325 times 28. So the population of the gray wolf in 2008, or 2006, was 2,800 and rounds the nearest wolf, so 845 wolves in 2006. Part two, does the model, so does the function, underestimate or overestimate the actual gray wolf population from 2006? And by how much does it underestimate or overestimate? The actual population in 2006 for the Western Great Lakes was 3,949. And the model, the function that we used in part one, the model says the population was 2,845 wolves. So the model is definitely an underestimate, a considerable underestimate. And that is, and the estimate is off by 3,949 subtract 2845. It was off by 1,104 wolves. So what this should tell us is that the exponential function was not a very good predictor of the population for 2006. They were off by over 1,000 wolves for 2006. And that's because exponential functions grow very quickly. We were using 2006, which was 28 years after 1978. That's the considerable number of years after 1978. So it may not be a good predictor, and this was not. All right, and now we're going to finish the section with a very common application of exponential functions called compound interest. This first sentence is coming from the textbook. We all want a wonderful life with fulfilling work, good health, and loving relationships. Financial security definitely would not hurt any of those. So in achieving the goal of financial security, you have savings accounts, checking accounts, mortgages, loans, certificates of deposit, retirement, 401ks, 403ks for education, um, investments. They all use what's called compound interest. Compound interest is a different type of interest that, as compared to the interest we talked about earlier in the class. We talked about simple interest earlier, and that was interest calculated on the original investment only. It was principal, the original investment, original deposit, times the interest rate as a decimal, times time, which was in years. This is interest on the original, in the original principal only. Whereas compound interest is interest computed on the original investment and any accumulated interest. So it is compound interest is calculating interest on your outstanding balance. Not the original balance, but your outstanding balance. So it gives you interest uh, calculated on the interest. So here's a, an example of how compound interest works. You have, we're going to use A for the accumulated balance. You take after one year, just one year, you take the original amount that you deposited plus the interest. Now, after one year, simple interest and compound interest are the same. 
So you add in the interest after one year. And interest is the same as simple interest, so P times R times T. Notice that there's a P in common that you can factor out as a GCF. And this is um, simple interest after one year. If you make the T1 for the amount after one year, R times 1 gives you R. And so this is the compound interest formula for one year. They're calculating the interest, and which is, you take your interest rate and you add 1, and you multiply by the deposit, the original deposit or principal, and you get the accumulated balance. That for one year. And you can see that down here. After one year, that is the amount of the accumulated balance. However, starting with the second year, simple interest and compound interest are not the same. The second year, compound interest gives you interest on the interest you've already earned. Not the original amounts, it's the original amount and the interest. So what happens is that you take 1 plus R was representing the interest rate for one year. If you do, if you want to calculate interest on the interest, two years, you multiply by 1 plus R twice. So you get 1 plus R squared times P. Three years, you would again multiply by 1 plus R to get 1 plus R squared from the second year times another 1 plus R. That gives you the amount after three years. And four years, very, very similar, four years, you multiply by 1 plus R four times. So it looks like we have a pattern emerging. So if you calculate interest after T years, it would be P, the original investment, times 1 plus R to the T exponent. This is called the compound interest formula. with interest compounded, or some people use the word calculated, one time a year. So that would be annual, annually. So if, if interest is calculated once a year at the end of the year, every year, this is the formula to calculate the amount you have in the account with interest calculated on the interest and the original amount. So this is one type of interest. You can have interest calculated annually, so once a year. You can also have um, saving institutions calculate interest more often than just once a year. They could calculate interest every six months. So they calculate interest on your outstanding balance every six months. That's called semi-annual interest. You could have interest calculated four times a year. That would be interest compounded quarterly or every three months. Or the one that's the most common, uh, savings accounts, checking accounts, mortgages, loans. Um, they are all calculated with monthly interest, which means that that type of interest is calculated 12 times a year or compounded 12 times a year. So in general, you can have interest calculated several different times during one year. So this is called compounding periods. So if compound interest is paid n times a year, it's called you have n compounding periods a year. And we're going to finish up with an example of describing the difference between compound interest and continuous compound interest. Compound interest has a definitive number of times interest is calculated or compounded a year. Semiannual, two times a year. Quarterly, you calculate interest four times a year. 
monthly, you compound interest 12 times a year. Continuous compound interest is different. There is no definitive number of compounds in a year that interest is calculated. Compound continuous, continuously, the number of compounding periods increases infinitely. So this is a different formula. These are the two formulas for compound interest. T's in years, the balance of the account is A, the principal is P, and you have an in annual interest rate which must be in decimal form to use it. If you have compound interest, that's this first formula, you have N compounding periods a year. So that could be two times a year, four times a year, uh, 12 times a year, or six times a year. It depends on how many times interest is calculated a year. And this is called the compound interest formula. A equals principal times one plus R divided by N. So you take the interest rate and divide by how many times is interest calculated a year raised to the n times t exponent. If, it's com if the interest is compounded continuously, it's an entirely different formula, and this is where you have an application of the number e. It's principal times this number e that we talked about earlier raised to the rt exponent. And r is the interest rate, and time is still in years. Let's try example five. It's going to illustrate the difference between the two different types of compound interest. Suppose that you decide to invest $8,000 for six years. So P is 8,000, T is six years. Original investment. T is six years and the bank offers you two different accounts. The first account pays 7% interest so R is 7% or 0 0.07 as a decimal and the interest is compounded monthly so they give you interest every month and is 12 compounding periods in one year. So let's calculate what the balance would be for this first account. It's compounded 12 times a year, so it's this first formula. Principal times 1 plus interest rate divided by n to the nt exponent. So 8,000 times 1 plus interest rate as a decimal divided by 12 to the 12 times 6 years in the exponent. So let's try this out on the calculator. Eight thousand parentheses 1 plus 0 0.07 divided by 12 close the parentheses then raise to the exponent and make sure the exponents in parentheses, 12 times 6. So it looks like after six years, the balance is $12,160, and it wants us to round the answer to the nearest cent. So that's two decimal places, 84 cents after six years. So that's not too bad. We had $8,000. The, in, the with interest calculated every month for six years in a row, the amount in the account grows to $12,160.84. Okay, on the other hand, we were going to compare the first account with this second account. The second account is 6.85% interest, so the interest rate is not as high, 6.85% change to a decimal. So remember, to change percent to a decimal, divide by 100. 
But this time, the interest is compounded continuously. So there is no value of n because it's continuous interest. So it's this formula for continuous compound interest. A equals P e to the r t. Some people like to say that's pert. It looks like pert. So a equals 8,000 for the principal. e is the number e, 2.718281828 and so on. r is the interest rate, 0 0.0685, and then time is still, still six years. So the amount will grow to 8,000 e second, then the division sign, exponent, make sure the exponent goes in parentheses, 0 0.0685 times 6 years. Ooh, it's close. $12,066 and round to the nearest cent. So even though it's 0 0.60, you still need to put 0 0.60. If you put 0 0.6, that doesn't mean anything. 0 0.60, two decimal places. So $12,066 and 60 cents after six years. So which one, now they're asking, which is the better investment? First account, you gain, you actually gain a little bit more in interest, about, what was that, $95 more in interest. So this is the better investment, account number one. So this gives you a couple examples of how to use compound interest. One's using compound interest with interest compounded monthly. The other interest was continuously. And they're two entirely different formulas. So this finishes up section about, about exponential functions, their graphs and applications. If you have any questions about any, any of the examples that we talked about, please let me know. Or if you have any questions regarding the homework as you work through those, please let me know that as well. And I look forward to seeing you at the next video when we talk about logarithmic functions.